did we just listen to? <laughs> we listened to this CS. Let me get the right. Let me get the right name for you. Here. I've been calling it a CS16 just for short. It is a CS Bluegrass 16, and it is from what I'm getting more and more information every time. I really wasn't all that aware of this model, um, so I'm learning a lot about this one. Custom shop. Made in 2016 for the NOM show, and that's why it's got the 16 on it. Bluegrass model, as you can see, it's got a large sound hole, the bound fingerboard. It has the low profile modern taper, super duper players action neck on it. <laughs> you know, uh, I, that, I can't keep up with all the marketing names on this, but I would tell you that the neck on this is slim, not super slim though. It's got, it's, it's nice. It's got just about the perfect amount of meat to it. It's got a very soft V to it. It's like a slim down LS V neck. Um, it, I don't have very many complaints about this neck. You know, I always complain about necks, right? This one's pretty good. I would give it a 90 on a scale of 100 and very, 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 very few guitars hit that 100 mark, you know. Uh, really good. So compared to the LSV that I have sitting over there, which I'll AB with it eventually, it's a slimmer neck from front to back. And if you ever play a 41, uh, D28 41 Authentic, this is a, is a little bit chunkier neck than that. It's also one and three quarter inch, so it feels wider. Uh, the taper going up the neck is super, it's a super even taper, so it feels almost the same here as it does here. 
you know, it's a little bit fatter as you go up, but more, it's a, it's a nice taper, no matter where you are on the neck. That feels really, really good to me. I like V-necks. I like soft V-necks because of where I put my thumb. Um, I do not like C-shapes because the top of that C pushes my thumb out and it's just not as comfortable for me, you know? I could almost thumb wrap on this. It's a little bit... A little bit big, but I could do it on it, you know? Lots of room in there. It's just a great neck. Okay. Um, it is Guatemalan Rosewood, which I think this is the first Guatemalan uh, Rosewood I've seen. It's a little bit of a heavy guitar um, compared to, you know, certainly coming off of mahogany guitar. But even compared to that LSV, this guitar feels just a little bit heavier, which I would expect because the wood's dense, you know. It's a dense, heavy wood. Coco Bolo, for instance, is... Coco Bolo weighs a ton. Um... I remember Mario Poo telling me that his biggest challenge with Coco Bolo was to try to lighten it up a little bit. Uh, and so I get that kind of feel out of this, a little bit of that Coco Bolo feel. It's not super distracting, but I'm just I'm just commenting on it. Guatemala and Rosewood, um, red spruce top. My understanding, it has a thin finish, and I believe it. I'm being very careful with this guitar. So what I did... In this comparison, was to cut the saddle slot into a long saddle slot. It had a short drop-in saddle, and we decided to convert it to a long through saddle. I'm not done with this yet, because this guitar, as I've been talking about in the past couple of videos, really needs a neck reset. I'm going to show you the saddle here in just a second. The saddle is really low. The action is good right now. Um, you know, I'm able to play it pretty well. But there's absolutely no saddle left, you know, to, to to move with. When it came in, in case you haven't seen the previous video, when it came in, this saddle was even lower than this. It had an under saddle pickup in it. Saddle was so low that the low E was not even touching the top of the saddle. I mean, it was just kissing the top of the saddle. The same with the E, the B. The D and the G were touching a little bit. And um, the bridge was non-slotted. So slotting it and ramping it just a little bit did give me a little bit of a bite angle and the previous owner had the action set at 75 thousandths of an inch which is i mean that's low man that's lower than my telecaster back here my telecaster is about 85 thousandths of an inch so it's lower than telecaster my telecaster um yeah man it was just low so i raised it up to i had a saddle of about 90 thousandths of an inch which is like I prefer not to go below about 110. I'm talking about the height of the saddle out of the bridge. I would prefer not to go any lower than 110. That's what my uh, personal D28 1941 Authentic is set out right there. But the action on it is perfect. So I can accept a saddle of 110 if the action is perfect. This action is still just a touch high on the low E and the A. And so you see I, what I'm getting at. And the neck relief is absolutely flat the other day i was talking about my new trust side wrench and i showed you i set the neck relief at two thousandths of an inch so my whole point here which i'm getting to here is that i am at all of the limits on this guitar i've got the saddle as low as i want to go i've got the neck relief as flat as i want to go and the action is up here at the verge of being too high but we are maxed out on all limits what I consider limits, you know, for for good reason. I mean, I have my reasons for this. So, I'm almost certain we're going to do an equity shot on that because the owner says, you know, the owner's like, you know, uh, free reign on it, you know. I'm just a little nervous um, <laughs> because of the thin finish. And, you know, I'm just cautious. I'm a cautious guy. I'm not... Um, I don't rush into things unnecessarily. I like to think about it for a little bit. So I've thought about this guitar, and I just don't see any way we can get around, you know, this saddle. The bridge is a perfect height. I don't want to shave the bridge. I don't want to take the bridge off. And so really the best solution here is to do a neck we shot and give it about 20 or 30,000. Let's see what I say, about 95. Yeah, I'd give it about 30,000 of an inch more saddle. Um, 
thirty thousandths of an inch here is ten thousandths of an inch off the heel. So you know, that's about a third of what I do to your typical seventies when it comes in. So, but in order to make it really, really good, perfect, as perfect as I can get it, um, that's what it needs. And the fact is, the guitar is here. It's sitting on my bench. It's in my hands. Like one of the one of my uh, viewers commented, he said, you know, lots of people would just love to have their guitar sitting on your bench right now. Uh, thanks, you know, I appreciate that. But yes, that that's the point exactly here. Uh, you've got the shipping to consider, you know. Uh, I mean, the, the smart thing to do right now is to just go ahead and give it a very mild neck we set, 10 thousandths of an inch, drop it into which perfect. This guitar is, is 2016. So four, seven, it's seven years old. So it's probably, you know, stabilized enough. Like this D18 back here, which I did, uh, it's a D18 1939 aged authentic. I've done three neck resets on that guitar, but the first two were when it was brand new and the factory just didn't give it quite enough neck angle. So I went ahead and did that. And then it changed over the next several years so that it really needed another one to get it, you know, to get it good so i did that and so far it's, it's just been really it's been stable the point being this guitar is seven years old it's got a little bit of age on it it's probably settled in so doing a neck reset on it now um you know my my gut feeling uh it's going to be good for quite a while all right so reason i told you all that first of all in this video you should be listening for the differences between the short saddle and the long saddle. Now, I went ahead and cut the long saddle now because we had a chance to compare them like that. When I do the neck we shed, it's gonna have a tall saddle on it. So we can come back to this and I'll take this, this same clip and I'll use it again and we can compare the difference between this very short saddle and a taller saddle because that's two of the questions I get all the time. Is there any difference between a short saddle and a long saddle? We just looked at that. The action's the same. The saddle height is, is pretty much the same, you know. Next time we see this guitar, it's going to have a fresh neck we set. It's going to have a taller saddle. So we'll be able to compare the sound of that taller saddle with the shorter saddle. And we can see, are there any differences? Now, I'm not, a, as I said before, I'm not a fan of really tall saddles. If this action was perfect, you know, I could live with this saddle personally, but again, a lot of the issue is this guitar getting shipped back and forth across the country. It's gonna need a neck reset in, in five years. You know, it's gonna move just a little bit more to where this isn't gonna work anymore. So the smart money again is to just go ahead and do the neck reset now. But again, if it was my personal guitar, I'd probably play it like this for a while and then when it was ready, you know, in five years. I'm getting older, though, you know. <laughs> Maybe I better do it now. <laughs> so, Smart Money says we should do the neck reset without sitting here in the shop and get it good. So we are going to be able then to compare the sound of the short saddle with the tall saddle. The strings that are on the guitar right now are D'Addario EJ-17s. I just changed them uh, a couple of days ago. I mean, they have zero play wear on them. They're pretty fresh. They're not going to be changed at all when we come back after the neck we set. I'm not going to play the guitar much anymore. Um, and my hands don't sweat anyway. So these are going to be the exact same strings in all three. You got to hear a little bit of difference maybe from loosening and tightening, but I think that's going to be minimal. Um, so let's take a close up look at the saddle. What I like about long saddles, first of all, I think they do sound a little bit different. The slot is shallower, and I know this for a fact because I filled the slot and then recut it, and I can see the fill down there. So I know the slot itself is shallower. So that means that there's more of the wood in between the saddle and the top. So Dan Lashbrook, for instance, uh, who I greatly respect, that guy is an absolute maniac when it comes to modifying guitars. I mean, you know, I'm here 
Dan is, you know, man, he pushes boundaries. Uh, I have a tremendous respect for Dan Lashbrook. He is a big fan of cutting saddle slots really long, <laughs> you know, clear out into the wings right here. And consequently, because of that, they're deeper because you can see that my slot stops up here on the, on the shoulder. Therefore, the slot is not as deep. When Dan cuts them, he cuts them clear out here, used to anyways, you know, probably still does. Cuts them clear out to here, and therefore that slot is very deep. Now, I personally have experimented with slot depth, um, using, in fact, the same exact saddle, where I started with the saddle, and, I, and um, I cut it deep, and then I shimmed it up, using, you know, using wooden shims, and made that same exact saddle shorter and shorter. What I hear, what I think I hear anyways, I'm going to describe what I hear to you, is that when the slot is deep, you hear more of the bone. You hear less of the bridge. So you could have a Brazilian rosewood bridge, and you really wouldn't hear the wood as much because the saddle, in other words, if you, if you took an extreme and cut that saddle slot all the way down to the top so that the saddle is actually sitting on the top inside the bridge, saddle would be sitting on the top, it transmits directly to the top. And my feeling there is that you hear more of the saddle than it's a harsher sound. It's a more focused, more direct, more punchy. Um, all of those adjectives. The difference to me and Dan, for instance, is Dan likes a very aggressive sound. I like a little bit more of a mellower. Um, I still like aggressive guitars. I mean, I like this guitar. It's aggressive. It's got a large sound hole. You know, I like that that trebly punch, but beyond that, there's something else that I like, and he really goes for a, man, a fundamental, hard sound, um, it's, it's aggressive, so, I hear a more aggressive sound when you push that saddle shot down to the top, when you have more wood in between it, I think I hear more of the wood of the bridge. Um, and that's just my, my gut feeling about this. I hear some differences here and here. So if you were to ask me what I hear in the guitar right now as to when I played it 20 minutes ago, actually about a couple of hours ago, with it had the short saddle shot, it seems to me like it is a little bit mellower now. It's a little bit richer, a little bit fuller. It lost a little bit maybe of the brittleness. You know, I think brittle is a good term to use. The troubles were so harsh but in a good way, but the troubles were harsh and sharp a minute ago. We're talking 10% here. I'm not talking a huge difference. I'm talking a little bit. Previously, the troubles were a little bit sharper, a little bit more punchy, and would probably cut better, you know? Now, it seems like it's a little bit more of the vintage sound. It's a little bit a little bit richer. The troubles are just a little bit softer. Um, I feel like the notes will blend together a little bit more. Which again, if you go back and watch the video I did where, where I had the, uh, I talked about what I listened for when I evaluated a guitar. And when I got to the end and I played the uh, D1837 Authentic, I said, you know, I don't like this guitar for the lead runs, but when it comes to that cross picking Carter family stuff, this guitar just, man, it, that's it. I'm done. I don't even want to play any of the guitar for that sort of thing. And that's because the notes blended in, in the kind of way that I wanted to hear. Okay, if you follow me. So I feel like this long shadow pushes this guitar that way a little bit. Now, because this is a Watermelon Rosewood and Red Spruce Top and a large sound hole, this guitar has got plenty of treble to spare. This is not lacking in the treble. <laughs> so it's got plenty of treble to spare. So it's okay if it mellows out that treble just a little bit because uh, this is this is not a mellow guitar. This, this is, is a biting, cutting, snappy, powerful instrument here. This is probably my favorite D28 right now. I would take this guitar any day over 37 D28 authentic. Any day. Because I am a big, I'm a big fan of large sound hoes, especially on um, Rosewood guitars so you know i this is this is this is a tremendously good guitar for me for
for my playing style and my opinion for the things that I want to hear, this thing is whew, awesome. So it does not hurt this guitar at all to soften those trebles just a little bit. Um, it's got plenty to spare. <laughs> it is so loud in my face here that, uh, that I'm afraid I'm blowing out the microphone, you know, but I'm watching the level up there. No, it, you know, it's okay, but wow, this is a loud guitar. So I'm going to reset the neck on it almost certainly. And then when I do, we're going to recompare it with the taller saddle. The action will be actually just a little bit lower. It'll be real close to this, but it'll be a little bit lower. And the shadow will be about 30 thousandths of an inch taller than this. At that point, then I will get the LSV out that's sitting over there. And I will compare this guitar to the LSV when they both have approximately the same saddle slots. You know what I mean? Um, I could. In fact, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do that right now. And what we'll do is we'll use the LSV as a uh, um, control guitar. I'm not going to make any more changes to the LSV. I'm done with it. So we get the LSV out right now, and we'll do a quick AB of it and this guitar. And then after I do the neck reset and it gets the taller saddle on it, which will match pretty close to the LSVs, we'll do that same comparison again. So you'll be able to hear this guitar versus itself, but there'll be some variables because I've loosened the strings, I've slacked the strings, you know, you know, that sort of thing. Not, not, they're never true chess. But we'll have two opportunities here. Then we'll have an opportunity to compare this guitar versus itself. And we'll also have the guitar, opportunity to compare this guitar right now versus the LSV. And then we'll have that opportunity again. So we'll have, be able to compare two things on there. Okay? So I think I'll do that. I'll take this very same clip right here and I'll just splice it into the end here and do an AB on that LSV. So. But that's what I've done here. I've done the long saddle. Now, you know, uh, if you disagree with the sound, if you didn't hear any difference in the sound, I like the looks of the long saddle better. And that's what I always fall back on, you know. People say, do you hear any difference in the sound? Or, oh, you know, maybe. Um, but I like the way they look a lot better. It's just got, it's, it's classic. And when you do a long saddle, right and i got lucky on this one i did this one really good you want i want like a vintage guitar i want the ends of it to come just barely in to the shoulder here okay i'll come up here and i'll show you that i want the ends to just barely come into the shoulder And I want the ends also to be very, as consistent as I get them. I mean, this is hard to do when you're riding it. It's, I want the same amount of shoulder on each end. And I don't want it too deep. I don't want these ends coming out way out in the wings. Uh, that's not the vintage look. This is the vintage look right here. And in order to get that right, you've got to take your, your router and you've got to move it this way up and down this way on the top, which very few commercial router jigs have the capability of doing that. But you want your router bit to kiss the top of the curve on both sides exactly the same before you start routing it. It's got to just kiss the top on both sides. And then you know you're going to get your slot level. And then you take it and you bring it over here and you drop it down and you drop it to about halfway down the slope, you know, where you want those to come out when you make your pass and if, if you're lucky and it comes out right you will end up with your saddle slot the same amount down these wings even though it's taller on this side than this side that's the thing you got to be careful about the bridge is thicker on the base side than the treble side so you can't set it level with the top it has to actually angle a little bit it has to match the router jig it has to match the angle of whatever this height is right here. And I've done that by using cork pads. And I've got my jig that works pretty good. Um, it's super simple too. So I use cork pads on there. And I've got various thicknesses of cork pads in case I need to level it just a little bit more here and there. But that's what I like. I like this. And 
which is like that long saddle. And one thing about the, the long saddle here is I always glue them in. This one is not glued in because I'm going to be taking it out. So this is always sort of an accurate test. But the LSV is not glued in yet either. When I get done with this, I use a smear of, uh, of uh, fish glue on the sides of the saddle. I've got a video on this, how to glue in a Martin Long saddle. And the purpose of the glue is not really to strengthen it so much, but it's to take up every single piece of airspace that there is. So you know there's airspace in between the saddle and the bridge because if it wasn't, you couldn't get it in there, you know? If you have an absolutely perfect fit, and I'm talking about like on a molecular level, you know, if you were the magic school bus and you were driving down here, you would not be able to fit in here. If you had that tight of a fit, the friction would be so great, you would not be able to actually get it in there. Plus, the size of the saddle slot would have to be absolutely perfectly parallel and so would the bottom. You know, that's impossible. It's impossible to do on a wooden structure. You can get it really good, but again, on the molecular level, no, there's going to be a little bit of a gap somewhere in there somewhere. Guaranteed. The slots are going to be maybe just a tiny bit V'd back over this direction, or, you know, the bit, the bit has motion in it, and you just cannot get it absolutely perfect. We live in an imperfect world, so I know this. So the point of the glue is to fill in all of those gaps. You put a smear of glue on there. You want your saddle fitting snug, you know, not super tight, but snug. So it slips in just right, snug. The glue then fills in all the air gap, and that basically welds. Yeah, if I could weld it, I would. <laughs> it welds the saddle to the bridge fills in all the air gaps, and now you're going to get, I think, I'm fairly sure of this, you're going to get a little bit better sound transmission because you have really locked that saddle into the bridge. So that's the reason I glue them in. It does add a little bit of strength. You know, don't get me wrong, it keeps the saddle from tilting. For instance, you know, like I said, you cannot get a perfectly good, perfect, perfect saddle stop. Perfect. Perfect. Can't do it. Cannot do it. Therefore, the saddle is going to want to going to want to tilt just a little bit. I guarantee it. It's going to want to tilt two hundred thousandths of an inch. You know, <laughs> I mean, some small amount. And I feel like the glue helps stop that. The glue makes it locked. Okay. I think that's going to change the sound just a little bit. And. I've done a, plenty of experiments on this. So, but neither the saddle nor the LSV are glued in right now. So let's do, I'm going to get the LSV out and then we'll compare these. In fact, I'll just re-record this again because uh, I think I was a little bit out of tune back there. And plus it's just easier for me to edit with a fresh, fresh cut down here at the end. So we'll compare it to the LSV and then we'll see this guitar again with the LSV in two weeks maybe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop the neck off probably this week. I'm just I'm just thinking about it, you know. Like I said, I'm cautious. And I'm going to be sure that's actually what we're going to do. So, let's recompare. You can tell me in the comments, what do you think of the long saddle versus the short saddle? Now, yeah. You're not going to get an under saddle pickup under this. And it's going to be hard for you to adjust saddles. But I feel like if you're using a winter saddle and a summer saddle because of changing humidity, uh, maybe you need to humidify more during the winter. You know, maybe you need to keep your humidity a little bit more consistent. There's still situations I know it's going to happen, you know, up in the northeast and far east coast where it gets 120% humidity <laughs> in the summer. Uh, yeah, you know, you might have to do that. But it's not that hard to loosen a fish glue saddle, a little bit of hot water on it, that's so uh, you can pop it out. But if you're the kind of person that likes to change saddles every day, um, you know, long saddle's not for you. Or you can just not glue it in, which I don't really advise. I advise you glue it in because it is a, it is a shallower slot. And um, 
I just, you know, you should glue it in. So there are people who, for whom the long saddle is not suited, guaranteed, you know, but it's suited for this guitar <laughs> and it's suited for me. I've got long saddles in both of my personal Prus. One of those Prus is a stage guitar. It's got a K and K pickup in it. So that does not interfere with the, with the saddle at all. Um, and, and, you know, that's, Partly why I like the K and K or the LR bags, I beam. Although I have mixed experience with the I beam, um, but point is, if you need to pick up um, the K and K, you know, is the way to go, in my opinion. So, all right, I'm gonna recompare. I'm gonna retune, and then I'm gonna we'll recompare these two. Thank you. 